Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to the Moore's Opera House. I'm Andrew Davis. I'm Dean of the McGovern College of the Arts at the University of Houston, and I was asked to give you a little context on where you are and what's around you today, and I'm really happy for the opportunity to do so. Thanks to the whole team for asking me to do it. Uh, the uh, McGovern College of the Arts is the home to the university's visual and performing arts schools. Those are schools in the visual arts and design, music, theater, and dance. We have an arts leadership program. Uh, the college includes the Campus Art Museum, that's the Blaffer Art Museum, and we have an innovative interdisciplinary art center that is the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Center for the Arts. If this is your first time in this building, and I've talked to several of you who told me that it was, uh, I hope you will enjoy being in this great space. The hall is internationally known as one of the finest performing arts halls of its kind in the country. That is not only because of the acoustics in this place, uh, they are regarded as nearly perfect by the acousticians who built the hall, and those are the same acousticians that worked on Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts in New York and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., uh, but it is also well known for the piece of art that is around you, or rather the pieces of art that are around you. If you will look up, you'll see one part of this piece. The rest of it is out in the lobby. You probably noticed it when you came in. It's really striking. It's on the ceiling. Uh, it is also on the landing. If you go out in the lobby and you look up the stairs to the second floor landing, you'll see more of this piece. Uh, this might be the most well-known piece of art in the public art collection, the wonderful collection of public art in the University of Houston system. It is also the largest installation in the United States by the great American 20th century abstract artist Frank Stella. Uh, and it is one of the most important pieces of art uh, in the city of Houston. Uh, and if this is not your first time in this building, even if this is not your first time in this building, I hope you will come back and see us. Uh, the McGovern College offers nearly 400 performing arts productions annually in music, theater, and dance, and we offer a constant stream of visual arts exhibitions in one of our five galleries devoted to student work and again in the internationally known Blaffer Art Museum, which is a contemporary art museum, just steps away from here that way on the campus, always free and always open to the public, always free admission at the Blaffer Museum. And all of this creates a really dynamic environment in which we are training the next generation of artists arts educators, arts leaders, and yes, arts entrepreneurs. And in fact, there is so much demand for our students in the region and nationally that several of our programs, music education, theater education, stage management, arts leadership, have a 100% placement rate for their graduates every year. Maybe some of these entrepreneurs will end up going to work for you. So welcome again to the Moore's Opera House uh, and to the McGovern College of the Arts. I hope you enjoy your afternoon. Uh, I am going to turn it over now to the Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations and the President and CEO of the University of Houston Alumni Association. This is my friend and colleague, Mike Paday. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Well, welcome. Welcome to the beautiful, beautiful Moore's Opera House and welcome to our 10th annual Cougar 100. Boy, that, that went fast. As Andrew mentioned, my name is Mike Paday, class of 89, and I'm serving as the Associate VP for Alumni Relations here at your alma mater, the University of Houston. And thanks, Dean Davis, for that wonderful introduction and the use of this beautiful Moore's Opera House today. I'm delighted to serve as your Master of Ceremonies, and the Cougar 100 celebrates the most rapidly expanding businesses owned and operated by University of Houston alumni across the nation, and we're excited to reveal this list very shortly. We've put together a very unique program for today. It's our pleasure to host a fireside chat featuring our friend and alum, Matt Mullenweg, a distinguished UH alumnus and co-founder of WordPress, who will engage in a conversation with the great Ernie Manus, who you all will recognize, of Houston Public Media. After we honor our Cougar 100 honorees, remember to please join us in the lobby for a heavy, heavy lunch reception in the foyer. You can network and mingle with your fellow alumni and also get the opportunity to meet our guest speaker, and our great president, Renu Couture, who has joined us as well. There will be a selection of heavy bites and stations. You will not leave hungry. We have several guests with us here today. As I just mentioned, please welcome the president of the University of Houston, Dr. Renu Couture. Our wonderful guest speaker today, Matt Mullenweg, co-founder of WordPress, who will be in conversation with Ernie Manus. 
Well, I want to welcome all university leadership here. If you're a member of the University of Houston's President's Cabinet, please stand to be recognized. Thank you all very much for being here. <laughs> University of Houston Alumni Association Foundation Board President Michael Sachs. <clears throat> and you met Dean Davis. If we have any other deans in the room as well, any of our deans, please stand to be recognized as well. Thank you so much for being here. Today is all about celebrating your remarkable achievements. The University of Houston takes immense pride in the accomplishments of our alumni whose success spans not just Houston, but the entire nation. It's our honor to recognize the business excellence in our alumni community today. We are deeply grateful to our generous sponsors, TDECU, Galen Financial, Goodman Financial, PKF, and Katz Coffee, whose support has made this celebration a reality. And as a token of our appreciation, TC TDECU will be providing all of our companies with a special commemorative gift available for, connect, excuse me, available for collection when the program concludes. So thank you again to all of our sponsors. This year, we are making the Cougar 100 directory available online. We will have it available on the UH Alumni website, where you can scan a QR code on the big screen on your way out. It is not only the official Cougar 100 listing and the first time you'll see the rankings, but also the web address and brief description so each of you can continue and start to do business with each other. Our companies owned and operated by alumni are encouraged to participate and all alumni can join these businesses in support. There you can find and post jobs on UH Link. I'm sorry, I left that a line. Go to our uhlink.com and you can post jobs, find jobs, become a mentor, find a mentor, volunteer for a group and many other ways you can participate all year round. We are thrilled to celebrate the remarkable achievement of everyone here today as part of the Cougar 100. With over 150 applications received this year, it's truly an honor to recognize the top companies in the United States and around the world whose exceptional qualifications and accomplishments have set them apart. There are 87 companies qualified this year out of the 150 applications that we received, so you'll be seeing those 87 walk across the stage here today. Your dedication and success stand as a testament to the excellence we cherish within our community. For those using social media, and I know you are, please use hashtag Cougar100 to tag your photos. And before I welcome our special guests, I wanna let everyone know that we are live streaming our fireside chat around the world this morning. And I wanna welcome all of our viewers from around the world to this very special moment. So now let's get to it. Please, wel please join me in welcoming our moderator today, Ernie Manus, who is the senior producer and host of Houston Public Media. Ernie has launched his broadcasting career with NBC News and Chicago Radio before joining, joining HPM in 1996 as an anchor and producer. Over his career, he has garnered 11 Emmys, five Katies, and the title of Ernie, ultimate interviewer from the Houston Chronicle. Did you write that? Did I write that? Okay. As he is actually the ultimate interviewer. As pledge spokesman, Ernie has been instrumental in raising over $2 million dollars for Houston Public Media annually, and his talents have helped PBS affiliates across the country raise $100 million in support of educational outreach. Please welcome Ernie Manus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Matthew Mullenweg is an American entrepreneur and web developer living in Houston, among other places, Matt, right? Houston is, he is known for developing and founding the free and open source web software WordPress and its parent company, Automatic. After leaving the University of Houston in 2006, excuse me, 2004, he worked at CNET Networks from 2004 to 2006, and then founded Automatic, an internet company whose brands include WordPress, Askimet, Gravatar, Vault Press, InstaDebate, CrowdSingle, and Tumblr. Please welcome to the stage our friend Matt Mullenweg. Ernie, I will leave the festivities to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Group. Howdy, y'all. Yeah, they're quiet. Okay, let's, I think the best place to start is my mic is going in and out. Do you hear it? I was going to keep talking. You'll figure it out out there. Um, place I'd like to start is the significance and importance of education mixed with understanding and appreciation for the arts, how important those two are and how linked together they are. And I've asked that of you because of your journey and your love of both sides of it. 
Yeah, growing up in Texas, I was so, or in Houston, so lucky to be exposed to arts education starting in second grade. So I went to Parker Elementary. I went in and started playing saxophone there because my father played saxophone. Then went to Johnston Middle School mm -hmm. and then was lucky enough to get into HSPVA. Any HSPVA folks here? <laughs> I know my friend Renee is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we met on the first day. We both played saxophone. And I uh, met on the first day of high school. And um, that arts education was really, I feel like, far more influential on me than almost anything else. Because you learn how to breathe, you learn how to speak, you learn how to be part of a team, you learn how to improvise, you learn how to do the things that I find, have found just so critical, particularly in the business world. Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed at how many folks in the upper echelons of business um, either have an intense appreciation for music or are incredible musicians themselves. I'm a little bit more on the former these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I often see that people don't connect technology with the arts, but so many folks that are involved in technology have an appreciation for the arts. There's that sense of structure and rhythm, but also that free-form nature that helps the creative mind do more. I feel like if you're working without music, you're not really working. Yeah. And I have, you know, music is the most amazing way to reprogram your brain. And I have different songs I'll put on for different types of work I do. Sometimes I'll put the same song on repeat for hours and hours. Sometimes I'll put the same album. Sometimes I'll switch it up depending on what time of day it is or what mood I'm in. Um, there's even programs now like Indel, which creates programmatic music for focusing or sleep or relaxation or different things. Um, so you can really, I mean, this is such incredible technology. Obviously, it's been since the beginning of humanity. We've been making music and rhythm. Yeah. And um, don't waste it. You know, if you find yourself working in silence, like consider what could you put on to enhance your creativity and your innovation, what you're doing. When did you notice people started being interested in what you had to say about topics? I don't know. Uh, one weird thing is um, there used to be a nonprofit in Houston called HALPC, the Houston Area League of PC Users. And it was this really cool technology nonprofit. And every month they do, uh, you know, talks. Um, I think in the early 90s, Bill Gates actually came and spoke. But then every Saturday, um, they had this little free place where you could bring your computer to be fixed. And uh, volunteers would fix it. And so my dad and my mom would drop me off in the morning every Saturday. And, you know, just as a kid, I would go and fix people's computers because they gave us free pizza. <laughs> so <laughs> I love pizza. Um, later, I founded a special interest group there. So. I, now I'm going to date myself, but does anyone remember Palm Pilots? Yeah? <laughs> it was kind of like the original, uh, it was a handheld device, but it had applications. Um, so a lot of what the iPhone does now was actually inspired by the original Palm Pilots. And um, there were these groups all over the country around Palm Pilots, but Houston didn't have one. So I founded HPUG, the Houston Palm Pilots Users Group. Um, I forget how old I was, 15 or 16 or something, but I ended up running this group every month. And it was such good practice because, you know, once a month, anywhere between 30 and 80 people would show up. And I had to have a program. I usually had a little prize. We usually try to feed people, so I'd find sponsors. And just every month we run this uh, program. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you f what I find interesting about listening to you speak is it doesn't come from the point of, and I hate to use the term, know-it-all, but more as somebody who seems constantly curious and looking further, looking for more. Is that something innately within you, or did it develop through your education, through working with people? That's a good question. I believe that humans are born curious. I mean, you can't look at any child growing up and say that curiosity is not at the core of the human spirit. I think what's important as we grow is to keep that flame alive and really feed it mm -hmm. and allow ourselves um, to really go down rabbit holes and follow our passions and make sure that we're spending time not just on social media and consuming, but on creating as well. And that could be anything. It could be writing, it could be journaling, it could be tinkering around on a piano, whatever it is, but we need to be generative. And um, yeah, curiosity, it's funny because, because I have a non-traditional background. Um, they, they were kind in how they put it, but I actually dropped out of U of H. <laughs> I, I did not finish my studies here. Maybe someday I will, if my credits haven't expired. But um, <laughs> the, the, there's 
sort of things I look for when I hire. One of the advantages for my company, which is called Automatic, um, because we had so much less money than the people we were competing with, you know, the big tech of Microsofts, Googles, Yahoo, AOL, et cetera, uh, we had to find the talent that they were overlooking. So two things we did it was one, because we came out of open source, we started hiring people all over the world. And so from just like open source projects like WordPress in 2003, none of us had ever even met. The co-founder of WordPress, Mike Little, and I had never met in person. We just knew each other online. I don't even know if he knew my real name at the time because I used because uh, I was so young. I didn't want people to know how young I was. So I used a, a, a sort of a pseudonym online. But, um, but we knew each other's work. We knew each other's code. We knew each other's writing. So we were able to connect. So in hiring, we were both able to hire people in non-traditional places. And I would always look for a few things. Um, curiosity being the first. Uh, work ethic. Uh, integrity. And taste. And I feel like those are four things, like I forget who it was, but it says you can't coach tall like in basketball. Yeah. Um, those are four things that people either have an innate drive for or they don't. And you can't teach them. But if people have those four things, they can and will learn whatever the business requires. You know, automatic being 18 years old now, WordPress 20. Gosh, there was no iPhone when we started, no JavaScript, no, <laughs> a lot of the things it's changed so much. So we have to constantly reinvent ourselves in every business, but especially in technology. You have to constantly reinvent yourself. And so uh, that's really what matters the most. Going off where I was headed right now, but because you bring this up, I have to think about constantly reinventing itself. New things continue to come along. There's a lot of talk out here now. We're all concerned about AI. And I'm curious from where you sit, is it a tool we should be worried about, or do we misunderstand what we're talking about when we talk about AI? I mean, that was a simple question, but we could spend the rest of the day answering it. <laughs> but I'll try, I'll try to do my best to summarize, because this is my current obsession. Mm -hmm. And um, for many years, I've been very enmeshed in this space. Um, I think we should be worried in the sense that um, anytime we create a new technology, it comes with great responsibility. And this is the closest thing I've ever seen to actually creating a new form of consciousness or, or sentience, a life form. You know, it behaves in waves which are unpredictable. How beautiful is it that, you know, at sort of the, the apotheosis of, of technological creation, We've created a computer that is so human, that makes mistakes, that makes things up, that lies, that hallucinates, <laughs> that's bad at math. <laughs> like we've created this whole new computing paradigm and, um, and we, it, that can't be predicted. It's not deterministic in a very kind of Turing incomplete way. So um, that of course requires you know, great thought. Now that said, um, what it can unlock is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every time new technology comes along, what's amazing about technology and capitalism and technological progress is when you think how much, not just the heights we've achieved, but how much a floor has been raised for every single human. Even things like access to information. Mm -hmm. There were times when you ha would have to go to a library where there were only certain books, you know, available in certain places and they burned down and they've lost forever. And now think, you know, we have five billion humans now with access to the internet, with Wikipedia and everything on the internet, the wealth of human knowledge at their fingertips in milliseconds. And look at the progress we've had since the creation of that. The internet is the greatest creation humanity has ever done. And um, we are still seeing just the first chapters of what it's enabling in terms of progress mm -hmm. and the acceleration of progress too. I was just telling the president, um, I mean, the last 18 months, I mean, ChatGPT only launched, was it end of 2023? Yeah. Um, like a week or two before, I gave my annual state of the word address to the WordPress community. And um, I, uh, twice in the history of WordPress, have, have given like a, a sort of uh, call to action. Once was kind of in the 2010s, early 2010s. WordPress was based on a language called PHP. It still is at the core. But I knew that for the future generations of WordPress, we would have to really embrace JavaScript and becoming more like an application, not more like web pages you'd have to reload. So I, I said, learn JavaScript deeply. And I begged the community, like, please, we got to do this. 
Because, you know, WordPress is like being the mayor of a city. You can't tell anyone what to do. It's all volunteers. And so mm -hmm. you have, I have a pulpit once a year that I can get on talk. But um, people do what they want to do. It's a volunteer project. And then, yeah, uh, I think it was like nine days before ChatGPT dropped, I said, please learn AI deeply. <laughs> this is the next big thing. It's going to be amazing. And it's changing everything. Um, and we've worked with OpenAI for a long time. And I know a lot of folks. And just even in the early GPTs, you could see, like, wow, this is, this is actually something brand new. Is it something we should be, though, worried about in the concept of, and maybe I'm not thinking fully enough about it yet, but it's something that we can't seem to control, that it can get to the point where we can't be on top of it? Now, you should worry about it if you're not learning it, just like you, you know, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, you should worry if you're not learning how to type or how to use a computer. Um, so I would encourage everyone in this room to, you know, take, uh, you know, it's 160 hours, eight hours in the week. You know, take one of them and just play with all the new tools. There's a tool called Perplexity, which I now use instead of Google for almost everything. Yeah. You know, obviously ChatGPT is very popular, Midjourney for creativity and art. There's so many AI tools out there. So just play with them. Yeah. It's brand new. And we don't know what's going to happen with it yet. But the more you can engage with it and use them, the more it will able each one of you to do things you never would have imagined. You know, WordPress, my life missions, it started with WordPress, was to democratize publishing. I've since taken on two more, which are to democratize commerce. And then last year, democratize messaging. Mm -hmm. So democratize to me means taking something, it's sort of a Promethean mission, taking something that was only accessible to a few people, bringing it to everyone. You know, with WordPress, in five or 10 minutes, you can create a website that 20 years ago might have cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, and it's mm -hmm. far better. And so how do we take this and make it radically accessible? And that's what I mean when I say that technology often raises the floor. Technology is a profoundly um, democratizing force. Uh, for in the world and also for in terms of accessibility, which I really, really like. Like you said, we could talk about this all day, so I won't, but um, let's move on to the fact of how important it is, and I think all business leaders should pay attention to this, how important it is to know the user experience from whatever you're offering. Mm. You know, doing tech support gave me a ton of empathy because the people who come in on those Saturdays to HAL PC to bring their computers in. It was so funny because one of the things we do is we'd actually go down to the car or bring a cart because the computers were really big. So we'd <laughs> unload it. And their office is kind of near where our micro center was. On, um, is that 610 over there? There's now like a big building there, like an Amergy or something, but there used to be a micro center. And so often like we'd, you know, we'd drive a couple blocks to pick up parts for them. But the people who come in was so accomplished. It was lawyers, doctors, real estate agents, um, professionals, and I saw how frustrated they were with the technology. And really, my only skill there as a kid was, you know, how PC had a great internet connection. <laughs> and so when we didn't know, I Google was, I think this was kind of before Google, but we would, you know, Excite or Lycos, or we'd search for online documentation for how to fix what was wrong. And, um, but I always tell people, like, it's not your fault, it's the technology's fault. Um, but I saw everything during that tech support, even the, the sort of prototypical person who had used their CD-ROM tray as a cup holder. <laughs> really everything. And, um, but it was fun to kind of learn how computers work, put them together, like sort of dive into it, And um, even as a kid. It's funny because even today, if you join automatic, no matter what role, if you're joining as a chief financial officer or anything, your first two weeks at the company are doing customer support every single person, and every single person returns and does customer support for at least a week a year. And you still do it too, don't you? I do as well. Um, also, by dint of my position, I just get a lot of people contacting me, <laughs> which um, I kind of love, because um, it gives me, I think as an executive, you have to simultaneously be at the 40,000 foot view, and looking at what's coming um, around the corner, what the trends are, what's going on with the business, and then you really have to be in the weeds, in the dirt, um, you know, getting your hands dirty, weeding things, and you know, talking to customers and spending as much time with customers as possible, because that's how you can reconcile. If you're too abstract from things, you're gonna miss 
um, like you said, the user experience of what's really going on. And if there's any reason WordPress has been successful over the past 20 years, it's been a really strong engagement with the community and being responsive to the changing needs. In the same vein, talking about running an organization, how do you separate seeing your workforce between individuals and people and um, objects that you need to move a company forward? How do you separate or how do you merge the concept of if there has to be reduction in force, if there has to be change in plan, how do you as a leader find the path through that? Ah, that's an interesting one. Um, it's interesting. So when I, as CEO, um, the rough way I try to think about my time is spending a third on uh, technology and the products. That's really the fun part for me, you know, because I started coding everything and writing the documentation and making the websites and like, I love just kind of geeking out and nerding out on like, you know, what the next admin screen for WordPress is gonna look like or how we're gonna change how taxonomies work or something. Um, so that's a third. I find myself a third on, call it special projects or fires. So that could be a fundraise, it could be an acquisition, it could be a disaster, it could be whatever sort of is happening at that time. Um, but the final third and what I consider the most important third is I spend on people. So that's HR. HR actually reports directly into me at the company. It's hiring and it's performance management. So making sure that you know, when we hire someone, it's with the highest of hopes. But um, you know, we're still a small, scrappy company and we are fighting with uh, companies and trying to you know, open the web up and our competitors have valuations with a T at the end, trillions. <laughs> so we only win uh, by being faster and really community-based. That's really the story of open source, is it's, is it's um, not the concentration of power, but the sort of spreading out of power that enables you to compete with the very, very largest and most successful companies ever in history. So that, um, yeah, we, we've never done a layoff at Automatic, um, but we are smaller than we have been at our peak. And um, some of that was we, like many companies, we hired a ton in sort of that boom period in 21, 22, and, um, and of course, no one is bats a thousand in hiring. But two, there are productivity improvements coming, uh, particularly these AI tools. And so I think the future of tech companies, and this will be interesting, might look more like sports teams or something, where you have fewer people, um, but maybe all making seven or eight figure salaries. So they'd be very, very highly leveraged. And um, I could definitely see a path for that. You know, Sam Altman has said, uh, we will probably see a, a one or two person billion dollar company in the next year or two. And I think it's very, very possible. If you look at companies like Midjourney or something like that, they are so large and so profitable and serve so many people, relatively small teams. Telegram is another one that's amazing. 40, 50 person team serving 700 million monthly active users. There's nothing like that before. I don't want to get political, but I do want to get philosophical with you for a moment on what's happening at the Supreme Court right now, or at least yesterday. They were looking at, you know, in a sense, some will call it censorship, others free speech, of what's happening online. Where do you see this argument and how do you come down on it? Hmm. That's a tricky one. Like, definitely, it's impossible uh, to deny that so much of what's happened in technology and with the internet over the past 30 years was with a light touch. Um, but I don't believe in no touch at all. And we have sort of delegated some very important decisions around like content moderation and what should be allowed um, to private corporations who, by the way, don't want it. They don't want to have to make these decisions. I think it's amazing if we could have a system that incorporates more of our democratic system <laughs> that has balance of powers, executive, legislative, you know, the, the court system, um, to really decide some of these hairy issues. Because when you're deciding about not just freedom of speech, but freedom of reach, um, I think it is sort of critical that this reflects the will of society and citizens in a more broad way than these companies, which are small and probably gonna get much smaller <laughs> in the future. Do you see things like Facebook, X, Tumblr 
as utilities or as publishers? Um, you know, it's like saying, is a car a horse or a boat? You know, no, it's something else. <laughs> it's, it's a new thing. Yeah. And um, I think that some of these laws that we're talking about, were, some of them were written like 100 years ago. And so I think it's very, very important, and I hope that we can unlock some of the, the legislative uh, gridlock we've had to really come to a compromise on what, in a just society, how should these things be talked about? And we've had some really great regulation in the past, um, like the DMCA, for example, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, actually strikes a really great balance between protecting the rights of copyright holders, because you know, there was some rampant piracy in the early days of the internet, and also protecting you know, the platforms and protecting users. There's ways to like, you know, counter these things. And we have even sued companies that are misusing the DMCA process to protect our users. So I think those are the types of legislations that I really like. Um, but there's some bad ones too. Like gosh, the EU for all its, I love that they got Apple to adopt USB-C, thank you. <laughs> but man, the cookie pop-ups are just driving me crazy. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, Technology moves very fast. We need, I think, government to start moving a lot faster as well. I often say, you know, we're so busy spending, taking time with new world problems with old world solutions, and that these two aren't always going to meet. We've got to find the new solutions to the new problems we're facing. Um, last thing before we wrap up for this part, uh, I'm curious, you know, you're back on your old campus here, how it feels to be back here, how how it feels to be in these halls. You said you've spent a lot of time in here as a student. Yeah, well, even from the HSPVA days. I mean, when was this hall built? Morris? You know? No one's given it. A, a long time. Yeah. So this has been really amazing forever. Um, I, I think I said on the ride that some, some other parts of the campus were a little raggedy when I was here. <laughs> and now it looks incredible. Huge kudos. Uh, to the team, like the transformation of University yeah. of Houston um, is pretty, pretty like cool to see. If I were here in 2024, maybe I wouldn't drop out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really neat. <laughs> Although the, the siren call of San Francisco for technology is hard to turn down. Yeah. And that was even before I thought, you know, knew about the cliche of the tech founder dropout thing, which is uh, uh, very popular these days. Yeah. And for students here today, they want to go out into this world and they want to make something of themselves. Advice you have? You know, you hit on something really quite profound when you talked about curiosity. So please do not constrain your education uh, to the halls of this campus. Every person you talk to is an opportunity to learn something. And like I said, you have the wealth of information at your fingertips. Every single book, <laughs> all of Wikipedia, all of the open source code out there, um, it's there. And so really, I see that, uh, and it's no longer geographically constrained either. So this is why it's so far more important to really harness your ambition and to become the best in the world at something. Because you can't just be the best in Houston or Texas or America anymore, because you're now competing on a global scale. With, by the way, seven or eight billion people out there who are also hungry and ambitious and gonna use these tools to, um, impact society. So I always think about um, you know, how to leave, as Steve Jobs put it, a dent in the universe, and how to make things a little bit better than I found them. And um, we're all on the earth for a short period of time, relatively, but how can you, you know, lay some foundation that future generations can build on and uh, create something better? So that's, that's really how I think about life. And if you can find a way to connect what you're passionate about, to something that can outlive you. I think that is the recipe for happiness and contentment as well. Matt, thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank you, Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Go Kooks. Thank you so much. How about another round of applause for Ernie and Matt? Thank you all so much. Wow. Just, uh, just incredible, incredible, a heartfelt thank you, and, and we're really so grateful to everyone who has, who has joined us both in person and on live stream, which I know we have many folks who have joined us for this live and unique and memorable occasion. So thank all of you who are watching the live stream. Have a great rest of your day.